Good morning, everybody. It is February 12th. It is 11 a.m. Eastern time. So that means it is time for Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. Today, I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Martin Marin of Tufts Medical Center, as well as the Shannon T. Mass Center at Morristown. And we have a special guest today. Our guest is Karen Klimzak, who is an amazing HCM warrior. And we are going to hear about her story in a very unique way. We are going to have Marty commenting in on some of the medical aspects of HCM, as well as his, his experience working with Karen through her entire process, which is a very exciting one. I'm not gonna give away the end of the story yet. We want you hanging on every word because it's really an amazing story. Today, we're going to feature some concepts about center of excellence care modeling, about the research that has been done to ensure patients with HCM are as safe and healthy as possible and have a really good opportunity for good outcomes. And we're going to hear about how the HCMA's work was behind the scenes the whole time and how we were able to hopefully make a meaningful difference in one family's life. So um, I'm, we're all here now. So Marty, Karen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa, um, for having us. And thank you so much, uh, Marty Marin, for um, being a part of this podcast. Hi, hi, Lisa. Hi, Karen. And uh, hello to all the patients in the HM community tuning in. Thanks for tuning in. And it's a, it's a special podcast today with Karen. And I think we're going to really gain a lot of insights and appreciation based on her journey. So I'm excited to, to talk to her. And I want to thank her uh, for taking the time to, to talk to us today. She's recovering and um, she's still healing. And nevertheless, she found the time to, to, to talk to us. So it's a really a special opportunity. So thanks, Karen, for doing that. Okay, thank I'm going to so set much. it up a little bit. I'm going to yep. set up the story a little bit. Okay. And um, for those of you who are viewing, you will notice that there's a little gauze on Karen's neck, which will become <laughs> obvious as to what that's all about soon. For those who are listening, you're not getting the imaging. So um, let's start out with Karen telling us a little bit about her life around 2002, 2003. So can you take us back and tell us what was going on then? Sure. Um, around, I was around uh, 23 or so, and I was just living my life. I was an active 20-something, um, and I decided I wanted to make a career change from um, human resources and interviewing and recruiting um, to becoming a dietitian. So as part of that, um, I was an active person, and um, I like to go for runs. Exercise is always a part of my life, and always a way that I, um, I let go of stress and kind of um, took on my day. And um, during that time when I was taking classes, I noticed I'd go out for a run and then all of a sudden I would end up on the ground. And, um, you know, so <laughs> it was really surprising for somebody that would um, go out for a run frequently or somebody that had no problem playing tennis, climbing mountains, um, you know, doing all the active stuff that one might do around that time or growing up. That's just something I've always done. So this took me um, by complete su surprise um, that I, um, I started passing out and not knowing what was going on. Um, but I actually, at first, to be honest with you, I, I just thought it was kind of a fluke thing. I wasn't really sure um, you know, what it could be about until it started happening um, you know, multiple times. And um, to give you some examples, so I would go out for a run and then I would, um, all of a sudden I would just feel something really funny and I would wake up and I'd be looking up at a tree or looking up and I would say, oh my gosh, I just, I don't know what hit me. I felt fine, you know, going out. So what's going on? Um, and uh, so, you know, like I said, I, I started just going to my regular physician, not really getting um, anywhere. I, I was told I had a heart murmur, but nothing, you know, other than that. But when it started happening on my way to class two weeks in a row, um, and I was picked up by the ambulance at the, um, the university campus ambulance, um, I was brought to the infirmary and um, you know, everyone, they looked at to see if I was on drugs. They asked me, are you eating enough? They asked me, are you stressed? Is this 
hormonal, you know, everything that you can imagine, they asked. And um, I said, no, you know, I ate a great breakfast, got in my car, drove to, to class, and here I am on the ground. I have no idea. I just got out of my car and, you know, I've never used drugs. I, <laughs> I just want to go to class, you know. Um, so it was at, at that point that I, um, after two weeks in a row, um, that I uh, was brought to a doctor. I, I lived in Connecticut at the time, and um, I was brought to an electrophysiologist who did some testing on me and um, figured it was something maybe with my blood pressure. You know, maybe your blood pressure is dropping too low. And, um, you know, maybe this is just, again, hormonal, so, something that's going on. Um, so they did a tilt table test and I, I failed the tilt table test. My heart actually stops when, I, um, when I'm on that test. So we thought, okay, I'm just going to give you some medications for your blood pressure. And um, you might have this thing called neurally mediated syncope. So, okay. So we increase the water, increase the fluids, increase the pressure and, you know, pretty much I'll monitor you, but you know, you should be fine. Well, this went on for three years of back and forth of, um, I'll, I passed out it occasionally, you know, when I go out for another run, let's bring you in. Okay. I, I don't really detect something, but there might be something. Um, at the time, my heart rate was in it in the mid to low forties to high thirties, but you know, my, um, my doctors at the, at the time thought, well, you're a runner, you're active, you know, your, your heart rate's low because you're healthy. Um, I didn't really think that third in the mid thirties or high thirties was really that, um, normal. I didn't, yeah, normal. Exactly. I said, you know, I'm a runner, but I'm, I'm talking like two or three miles, you know, some days I'm not talking marathon. I'm not talking speed. You know, I'm not really a conditioned athlete. I'm just like, you know, jog around town kind of girl. Um, so I, I just, I was pretty persistent and I was, um, you know, again, for three years, I went to, um, neurologists. I went to, um, I went to endocrinologists. I saw a variety of different, um, cardiologists, every, you know, EP and then multiple, um, cardiologists at various, um, local hospitals. And I just got the same answer. You know, we don't really see anything. What, what was the aha moment where we went from, we're not quite sure why your blood pressure is dropping to HCM? Great question. Um, so finally, after, you know, continuing to press uh, my doctors, um, an MRI of my heart was ordered. And at that point, I was in there for over two hours. I want to say two and a half hours in this MRI machine. It was, um, it was not my first because I did get a few concussions from those falls, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was the longest one I had been in. And um, I was called in to, to receive the results. And I was told, you know, you have a slight thickening in your left ventricle. I'm not quite sure it's really of concern, but it might be something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I said, okay, wait, excuse me, what was that again? And I wrote that down and I said, well, is this something that you've seen a lot of? And at the time the doctor was like, well, you know, we see it, but you know, I, I really, he was very unclear, you know, when I was, um, when I was sitting with him. And so I said, well, who does, you know, there, if you know of this, there's gotta be somebody that specializes in this or has a lot more knowledge. And that is when the name um, Barry Marin was given to me. So I immediately took that home and um, Googled it <laughs> like we all do. And, um, and I found the Abbott Heart Hospital out in Minneapolis at the time. And at the same time, I also started Googling around hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And I feel like that is when the HCMA popped up on my screen as well. And I was so excited <laughs> to have something, even though I wasn't sure if this is what it was, but just something. And so I, um, I believe I set an appointment to call the office, right? Maybe I wrote an email in somehow Lisa and I were able to connect. And that was back in the day when the systems were a little different and the volume was different. I, I remember getting the phone call and you're like, Oh, let me talk to you. And I did the intake myself. And you're like, I passed out <laughs> these many times and I've got this going on and that going on. I'm like, Oh, you really do need to meet Barry Marin. And I know you had an appointment within a couple of weeks of that. And when you meet Barry Marin, who those of you who don't know, Martin Marin is Barry Marin's son. So HCM runs in their family too, but in a very different way. Um, so you go see Barry out in Minneapolis and he recommends what for you? So he did all the testing again and it was very streamlined and it was amazing. All that was done in three years was pieced together in, I want to say a half a day in their office. Every, you know, everything, it was very clear what, what I was going to be having done. 
And um, at that point in his office, he sat me down at the end of the day, again, all these exams and things in one spot. Mm -hmm. And he said, um, you know, we, based on your, um, your symptoms, we've noticed that you have um, some thickening in your left ventricle. We also have noticed when we did the um, treadmill stress test that um, your blood pressure does drop when you exercise. And based on a, a number of um, syncopal or passing out episodes, we would recommend that you'd get an ICD um, to help to protect you because um, it's obvious that um, we believe you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and some of these passing out episodes may be um, due to arrhythmias or due to some kind of, um, you know, due to complications with the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in order to protect you from more of these um, passing out episodes and to protect you from concussions and potentially a lot worse. You now, this is what I would recommend. Um, but also what I loved was he said, but you know, this is your care and this is your body. So these are our recommendations, but it's really ultimately up to you as to what you feel is best. So Marty, let's take you back to 2006. Now your dad's out in Minneapolis with his practice and he's been studying HCM for a long time, pretty much your whole life. And he's done a lot of amazing work with trying to figure out who's at risk for sudden death and how to implement defibrillators in patients with HCM. Can you take us back to a little bit about how that transpired and how Karen would have gotten a recommendation in 2006 to get an ICD? Yeah, right. So, so it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, I think the if you kind of go back in time, you know, you have to realize that, you know, when you're talking about when, you know, the, the period of time when Karen was being evaluated, you know, at that point in time, there had been a number of different investigations by my dad in looking at what would be what we call risk factors, trying to identify what are the most important factors in a patient with HCM that would tell us that that patient could be at risk in the future of a sudden death event from a ventricular or abnormal bottom chamber rhythm. And therefore, if we thought their risk you know, was high enough based on you know, one or more of those markers or risk factors, that's when the ICD, which is implantable cardioverter defibrillator recommendation becomes considered to help prevent and protect patients at risk. So this story of who should get the ICD has evolved over many decades now, but at the time that we're talking about, one of the major advances had been that syncope or loss of consciousness was identified as one of those markers, particularly when it occurred in a repetitive way in a patient. And that was done and established as a risk marker, meaning that in a patient that had multiple loss of consciousness events, they did studies to demonstrate that that is a high risk situation, a dangerous situation that should warrant consideration for the ICD because patients that had that would be at increased risk at some point in the future for a potentially lethal arrhythmia, okay? And so what Karen was able to get by going to my dad in a HCM center of excellence at that time was that kind of insight that she wouldn't have been able and wasn't necessarily able to get otherwise, okay? And that demonstrates, I think, and underscores one of the more important parts of the discussion, which is the, the value here in this disease of centers of excellence where the type of research and insight into management is in fact as cutting edge as it is. Because as you'll see here, that decision to put in a device because of the recurrent episodes of loss of consciousness for Karen was very, very fortuitous, okay? So let, let, let's pause there for a second because yep. we don't want to give away too much of the story because there's a couple of twists and turns here that will get everybody's attention. So Karen gets her ICD. She's now living in Chicago. She moves to Chicago um, with her fiance slash husband and they're 
plotting and planning their life. You have some other testing done. You did some genetic testing. What did you find with the genetic testing? Yeah, exactly. We were, con we were considering um, having a child and what that might look like in the future. Um, so we got some genetic testing for the HCM genes. Um, and we, it was found that I had a double gene mutation um, for, you know, for HCM. So meaning two, two, two separate genes were identified um, in my panel as um, markers of HCM, um, potentially independent of one another. Um, as, you know, causing potentially um, HCM or HCM related um, disease. And so at the time that was really heartbreaking to me because I sat with a um, genetic counselor and he basically was like, you have the worst genes possible <laughs> for HCM, what it felt like, you know, when you're hearing this on the other end, um, basically your child could have one or both of these genes or none, but the, the chances of the, the child having no, none of the genes are actually quite slim because the two genes could be independent of one another or they can come as a pair. And, um, you know, hearing that when you are trying to plan a family and um, kind of taking everything into consideration was tough at that, at that point. Um, you know, so at that point we, um, you know, we were doing this just to kind of be responsible and just kind of figure out what would be our, you know, our best option, what, how would we proceed and um, would we be able to start a family? But 2009 didn't just lead you, lead you to become married and genetically tested. What else happened in 2009? So at that point, also just after all of this, I, um, I was on the treadmill and taking a walk and um, I went into what's called a VT storm. Um, so I had a ventricular arrhythmia that wouldn't quit. Um, so basically I pretty much fell off the treadmill and um, my device, so my ICD ended up shocking me the maximum amount of times that um, a device can shock. And then, um, so I found myself passed out on the ground um, next to my uh, treadmill and um, knowing that something had happened but not exactly quite sure what. Um, so not, not exactly sure what until um, my husband came home, found me, called 911, and um, you know, I, I ended up in the hospital to kind of figure out what had just happened. <laughs> so I'm gonna pause you there for a second. How long had you been married at that point? So we had just been married. This was in, um, gosh, we'd only been married, I wanna say like a few months at this point, <laughs> like six okay, months. Okay, so Marty, I have a research project for us. I had my stroke three weeks after being married. Karen has a cardiac arrest a couple of months after being married. Is there a risk factor here we need to look into? We'll, put, the, we'll put a pin in that. I'm jotting it down right now. We can take it. I'm gonna see if we can get funding for that. We'll see. I'll have to dig into that one. See if it's yeah, that, safe to be married. You know, but that does, you know, that does, you know, of course, you know, show us that, you know, if we if we just pause here for a second. You know, had Karen not gone to see a center of excellence in Minneapolis, where they were, of course, gaining the kinds of cutting edge insights in regards to who should get an ICD, she probably wouldn't have, may have not gotten an ICD for that reason. And had she not had an ICD, that event that she had at home that she just took us through in detail was likely a fatal event. And so Karen is alive and there are many patients out, out there with HCM with probably similar kinds of stories where the device in fact provided life-saving intervention for her. And at that point, the risk factor was the recurrent syncope. That's right. And that's why the device was put in. So a single risk factor was enough to make that call. I pause here with the announcement from the HCMA that patients need to take one risk factor seriously. Karen also mentioned informed consent and shared decision-making that Barry uh, Marin offered her an, an option, but that she was also responsible for accepting that option. So please take these considerations very seriously when a center of excellence is making a, a recommendation for a device. It may seem like I'm okay, I don't see this, but risks matter and we need to act upon them so we can protect families. So Karen, 
you, you recover from 2009, probably a little shell shocked. We talked a few times that year. Um, I think that year we actually, or so, shortly after that, we met in Chicago for dinner uh, one mm-hmm. night. So that was nice to get to, to see you there. But then you really reassessed and said, was Chicago the place for you? Your family's in Connecticut. So what happened next? Yeah, that's exactly um, what happened. You know, what happened is we were kind of assessing where we wanted to be. And um, at the time, so I had like a long span after that where my my health, you know, I was still working. I was traveling, you know, kind of still doing my thing, living my life. Um, my husband as well, of course. And um, I started to not feel as well. So I, I did reach out again to, to Barry uh, Marin. And because my family lives in Connecticut, he also connected me with um, Tufts and Marty Marin. Um, which was a great connection. Um, I talked to Noreen Dolan on the phone um, in Chicago, and we set up a time when I could meet uh, with Marty and Noreen um, to get an assessment while I was um, home in Connecticut for Thanksgiving. And um, at that point, it was a great meeting because I was kind of feeling, you know, I just wasn't feeling that same connection, to be honest, in Chicago as I felt when I was with um, both of the Marins, you know, both Barry and Marty. So um, I stayed, you know, I stayed over a few extra days in Connecticut to, to get an assessment and, and talk to Marty. And that's when we started talking about how things were starting to get a little bit more serious with my care. Um, you know, after having a few of these events and just not really feeling like myself, we, we started talking about what, you know, some future um, potential of looking at transplant in the long term and just um, even more importantly, just having a closer eye on my care and um, so we decided that we would move back to Connecticut to be close to family, but also to be really closer to Tufts, to be able to, to have that care that I felt was so essential to me feeling like I could live my life, which was definitely with Marty um, at Tufts. And because, the, as I mentioned, the care there, you know, it went from, you know, I was talking with Noreen on the phone to, you know, they set me up with a day that was very convenient. And I was able to come in and again, get fully assessed and just feel completely comfortable having these conversations in person and then also via phone um, whenever they were needed in order to get that that care and just to feel comfortable and confident every step of the way. So I'm going to pivot to Marty now. So we're 2012-ish and Karen comes walking into your office. What are your first thoughts? Well, my yoga instructor was, was had just come into the office. I mean, she <laughs> she she looked like my like a yoga instructor, and uh, she didn't look like you know. I don't know if there's a typical you know what an HCM patient looks like, but she looked very healthy, you know, and looked very like she was in very good shape. Um, and uh, you know, I was that was one of my first impressions. I was like, you know, wow, you know, she, um, you know, she looks really like she's in really good shape you know, there seems to be a disconnect here. And that's an important, I think that's one of them, that's another important sort of point here is that, you know, this is a disease that affects everybody, can can affect anybody, you know, HCM. And so um, just because somebody may look like they're in good shape, doesn't necessarily mean they're feeling like they're in good shape um, with HCM. Um, And so that's when we started to learn, you know, from Karen that, in fact, she was starting to not feel so good. Um, and it was despite the fact that she was taking such good care of herself, eating well, trying her best to stay in shape, doing yoga, she had HCM that was progressing and she was feeling poorly from that. But Karen wanted something else in life and that was to be a mom. Right. So Karen's like, I want to get pregnant. I'm like, ah, you're making me nervous. And I think she made a lot of people nervous with that. Um, so tell us about your pregnancy. First of all, was this, did you do IVF? Did you do PGD? Were you able to do any of that? Or did we go straight bio baby? So we did do, um, we did do IVF um, for, for different reasons. And, you know, it's interesting. We didn't end up testing for the HCM genes. At, when it all came down to it, um, looking at my care team, looking at um, what's available, we said, you know what, we're going to take a chance with this. That said, we did, um, for many reasons, we did need to do, I, we did do IVF, and um, it was a really successful pregnancy. And honestly, um, it was, I felt so 
great during pregnancy. Um, I just, it was just meant to be. It was a, a great time in my life. I had a great support. I was um, going to see Marty, you know, every trimester. And um, I was able to, you know, walk like I hadn't been able to walk in a long time. I just, I felt really great. Um, now, granted, I didn't have other kids at home and I had time to take care of myself. And I, and I really looked at it as an opportunity to do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I felt great and the pregnancy went great. I was able to, um, I was able to deliver the baby locally in Connecticut and, um, had a really smooth birth. Um, I was induced a few weeks ahead of time to make sure everything went smooth and that went great. Um, and the baby, um, her name's Eloise. She was, um, <laughs> she was, came out a happy baby, um, and all, all was going well. And, um, about a week and a half later, I, um, I had another uh, VT storm. Um, I was just out, you know, away from the baby for a few minutes, um, taking my dog for a walk. And I was not even a quarter mile from my house. And I felt great that morning. Nothing was different from any other morning. And um, like I mentioned in the past, I just ended up on the pavement, um, shocked and surprised. But this time I knew what had happened. I got myself over to a neighbor's house and was able to call for, for help and support and getting to the, uh, to the local hospital at that point. So I'll pause you here again, Marty, pregnancy and HCM. Well, I've done it and Karen's done it and a lot of other women have done it, but do we know as much as we need to know about pregnancy in HCM and the postpartum area as well, or is this an area for research? Well, I think we could probably always learn a little bit more for sure, in, in, particularly in an area you know, like this, but I, I will say this, I think that what we do know is the following, and, and that's that the vast majority of women with HCM do very, very well with pregnancy, okay? Um, in fact, as, as Karen was just saying, it's not uncommon for women with HCM to actually sometimes feel better with pregnancy, yep. particularly the second and third trimester. And the reason for that is that the extra body volume, plasma volume that, that is part of pregnancy, particularly again, second and third trimester, kind of fills the heart up a little bit more and can, for that reason, decrease some of the symptoms that a patient with HCM may be having before they're pregnant, like shortness of breath and chest pain, because you're actually decreasing the, the gradient or the outflow obstruction. So for that reason, for the vast majority of patients, we, we say pregnancy can be done safely and it's often a normal vaginal delivery unless there are other reasons to consider a C-section and that patients do actually feel better at times because of that. So now Karen has moved on to having had her daughter and having another storm and over the next couple of months, year, she's not feeling well and she comes back to you guys and it's now, what next? Karen, you wanna talk a little bit about what happened next? Sure, um, yeah, so yeah, and I just wanna underscore, I don't wanna slide past the fact that, you know, being able to have a child was the most amazing experience and, um, you know, I don't want the VT storm to overshadow that because I mean, having that experience and that opportunity was the, one of the best things in my life. I mean, absolutely hands down. And having had that gift of being able to go through that experience was so important to me. And so I just really want to underscore that and, and the support of Dr. Marin um, and Maureen Dolan too in, at Tufts, um, just supporting me that whole journey because yeah, she's the light of our life right now. <laughs> and I just don't want to understand that. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah, I mean, it's just such an opportunity and to work hand in hand in order for it to make that happen was just one of the biggest blessings um, for sure that I'm so grateful for. Um, so yeah, so I started to, um, I decided in caring for, for Eloise that I would be at home with her. And um, so as you know, I'm, I'm um, I had been more of a stay at home mom, I just started to not, I noticed a lot more fatigue and just not feeling that great. And, you know, it's easy as a, as a mom to say, ah, is this, you know, related to me being a mom all the time now, or is this related to my heart? Is this related to, what is it related to COVID, you know, these days? Um, but the reality was it was related to my heart. Um, so I would notice things like, you know, wanting to, no matter what I did during the day, I was always really, really tired or, um, 
you know, we have a little bit of a hill in our yard. We're out kind of a little bit in the country. And so getting back up the stairs and getting up the driveway and, you know, normal things that one would do, you know, with my daughter or just doing normal errands were just becoming so much more difficult. You know, grocery shopping was becoming really difficult. Um, holding conversations with friends and not feeling like really fatigued became pretty difficult. Um, going up the stairs without losing my breath um, became difficult. Little things that I it's easy to kind of one off say, oh, these aren't really a big deal. But then combined, I realized that my world was becoming smaller and smaller because I was asking for a lot of help um, with everyday, everyday things, even kind of self-care things. Like I would start to take a shower at night because I'd be so exhausted after taking a shower that I would have to go and lie down for an hour or two. You know, kind of little things like that, which again, you can, um, you can point to a lot of other things, but the reality was all these together, just something wasn't right. Um, so yes, I, I contacted um, the office again and um, I was happy to get another appointment with Marty um, for follow-up and, and just started to go down the path as to like, what's next, <laughs> you know? I've got this protection. There really wasn't any other medications that um, could support me. And um, I was trying to do everything lifestyle-wise, um, healthy eating, stress management, meditation, um, yoga, things that I really enjoyed. And also just kind of um, decreasing the amount of um, extra stressors, you know, just kind of keeping it with my family, friends, and a closer circle. Um, and all of that still, you know, it has an impact, but when you have a heart condition, when you have something more, you just, there's something inside you that tells you this, there's something more. Um, so when I, I saw M Marty, we, um, we talked about doing another exercise stress test to kind of see where things were in terms of next steps. And I believe after that test is when Marty and I sat down, um, Marty, I, and my husband, and he, and you mentioned that something looked quite different on this test and that it, it was time to start talking about transplant, the next steps, which is, um, I yelled at him when he said that word. To me. So I didn't want to say that word until I told him to. Eventually, I told him it was okay to talk about it again, but it took a long time. But so, Marty, you had you had that T word talk with um, Karen, and what were the clinical factors that made that conversation come up? Yeah. So, you know, so if if we if we kind of back up for for just a second i mean what karen is describing you know here is heart failure symptoms these are heart failure symptoms um and they are due in her to non-obstructive hcm okay so i'll just want to make the point particularly for you know the the, the listeners that you know, you've got obstructive and non-obstructive HCM, just to be clear, if, if Karen had had obstruction, H, obstructive HCM, and those symptoms, she would be a candidate for certain treatments, drugs and invasive treatments like myectomy or alcohol ablation, which are not available to non-obstructive patients who have heart failure, okay? So that's the, that's the clinical situation that we were dealing with, non-obstructive HCM in a young patient, otherwise very healthy, who was starting to develop heart failure symptoms. And I'll just say that that's probably, as I've told Karen many times, the most challenging, perhaps one of the most challenging to patient population of HCM because we just don't have very effective drug therapy to make patients feel better in this situation like we have with obstructive HCM. And that was why, and that is why when patients start to become as frustrated with symptoms as Karen was becoming, we start to look at how limited they really are objectively. And that's what she was just referring to. That's the special stress test that we use to kind of better understand how limited a patient like Karen is from the heart standpoint. And that, that test is a V, we'll call a cardiopulmonary exercise test, CPET, or known as well as a VO2 max study. And that helps us when patients do that in this situation, that helps us to understand better 
you know, how sick they are from their heart failure. And that's, that's kind of where we are in the story right now. So I'm going to pause Karen's story and go to a global story here for a moment. Yes. So um, many of the listeners know that I'm also a transplant patient. Um, but before I was going to transplant, I started to engage with UNOS because the listing criteria for those with HCM had always been a bit of a challenge. We didn't actually appear on their hierarchy of need of transplant. And Marty, you did some work about 15 years ago looking at the UNOS registry and found that only 1% of those who were receiving transplants actually had a diagnosis of HCM. So there was a disconnect with who could possibly benefit from transplant and how UNOS looked at us. So HCMA engaged UNOS into a conversation and we had an agreement that we would bring one of our advisors to the table to help write up new guidelines. And they would be presented to UNOS and then UNOS would have them circulated through their system and they would get approved or denied and they were approved. And Marty and I worked with UNOS to help delineate who with HCM should be listed, who should get special consideration for higher priority. And we worked on a pretty impressive document, I will say so myself. And it was accepted by UNOS and it is now at the basis of the listing criteria and we are actually a name diagnosis in the listing criteria, as opposed to being that other weird thing that people didn't quite know what to do with. Marty, you want to comment on that process and, and what difference you think that might have made? Yeah, no, I'll just say that I think that was well said. So I'll just say that, you know, just just to, to expand just for a second, you know, before you know, before the United States criteria for transplant were revised, as Lisa was saying a couple of years ago just so everybody understands, it was very challenging and very difficult to get a HCM patient like Karen with heart failure up the priority list high enough that they could get a heart transplant at least before they got super sick, okay? There were, because the criteria were developed for diseases that were not HCM going back mm -hmm. 10, 20 years ago. So the HCMA, Lisa, uh, advocated strongly to UNOS to revise this. And in fact, as you heard, they were two, two, two to three years ago to give a much more favorable weight to patients with HCM achieving the priority level on the list that would get them access to a heart transplant, which they would have otherwise not survive without. So it is, it is I think, uh, again, it's only about two or the new college is about two or three years, but I think it's, it's fair enough to say at this point, and, and we're gonna hear Karen tell us her own story about this, that that change has really allowed many more patients with HCM to get life-saving Trans, heart transplants that wouldn't have in, in the prior era. So Karen, you then, Marty mentions transplant, but then something happens in the HCM world because our HCM care model is an HCM center of excellence, but then we have to leave the nest to go to this other place called the transplant or advanced heart failure department. So how does that work at Tufts? How did that work for Karen working with both the Advanced Heart team and the HCM team? How, how does that happen? Karen, tell us from your point of view, then we'll get Marty's point of view. Sure, so like during the conversation, um, Marty mentioned that there was an amazing doctor um, named Dr. Amanda Vest, who um, he knew very well, or they knew very well and worked very closely with, with other HCM patients um, on transplant. And she was one of the um, transplant doctors um, who I potentially could, you know, he was going to, they were going to reach out to, which was really, it was a really nice bridge for me because you're right. I was in this nest of the HCM world and felt, as you heard, extremely comfortable with Marty and with Noreen and with the entire team. Um, you know, they've been there for me through everything, you know, through all of my vulnerable times and times when so many other doctors really just, you know, kind of, kind of looked the other way or just, you know, kind of wanted to hand me off to someone else. They, they took me, they held me, they, 
supported me and saved my life. And then, you know, to go to the transplant team was scary, but what was really nice is the handoff was really smooth because um, Marty and, um, and Noreen and the, and their office talked to um, Dr. Vest's office and actually Dr. Vest's office and um, their nurses called me directly to, um, to follow up about, I wanna say within a week of this appointment, just to make a connection, to introduce themselves and just to um, start um, planning for our, an initial meeting and to kind of do an intake of my symptoms. So it was very clear um, you know, how and where I would go. And also I felt a lot more comfortable because here I had a nurse reaching out to me to kind of make that bridge and to introduce me even before I met Dr. Amanda Vest, um, which was fantastic. Um, and also just trusting Dr. Marin and then knowing that he had this recommendation and felt very comfortable and worked with other patients, I immediately said, okay, this, this has gotta be the one, you know? Um, so that was, was pretty seamless. It was very seamless for me, actually. I, I will say though, I did call Marty's office just to make sure they didn't wanna see me one more time. <laughs> Because like I said, I felt really comfortable and they said, oh, no, no. Okay. You know, I think for right now, I think we're good, but you know, keep us in the loop with how everything goes. It, it, it is a little disconcerting when you you cut that umbilical cord and you're like, I don't want to go. I want to stay here. But Marty, what does it look like from your side when you transfer a patient over? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 as you know, we, 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 we are always hesitant to cut the cord. You know, we feel very strongly, you know, that we like to continue to follow patients with HCM and their drive the decision making with respect to their care. But there are instances where, you know, we have to, to some degree, cut that cord. And there's no question that, you know, this is one area where when an HCM patient does become listed for transplant. And that's really the, 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 the fork in the road, the, at least at Tufts, where if a patient gets listed, then, then we really do sort of uh, cut the cord, allow the advanced heart failure transplant team to um, really drive the care of that patient because they have to. I mean, they really have to make the adjustments. They have to know what those adjustments and meds and treatment are. And then, of course, because it dictates uh, the priority level for that patient for transplant. That doesn't mean that we don't get kept in the loop. It doesn't mean that we still don't provide input at different times. It doesn't mean that we still can't see the patient and say hi and provide opinion. But for primary decision making, that cord is cut at that time the patient is listed. So the cord is cut. And I have to say that through this entire process from 2006 to this day, the communication between Karen and the HCMA office has been pretty consistent. We might go months where we don't talk or we don't check in, but as soon as we hear somebody's listed, things kind of shake up a little bit and we, we change our, our communication model a little bit because there's other things that need to be discussed um, patient to patient. And so we've had those conversations over the years and um, we, we've been able to watch, you know, this young lady grow up, get married, have a kid, survive cardiac arrest twice, and now go off on a transplant journey. And I'm, I'm just, I'm going to kind of speed up a little bit here because we may have you back to talk about that transplant journey with a couple of other HCM transplants in the future. Um, it is, it's a harrowing process, but we're going to jump over all of the waiting angst and all of the testing and all of that stuff to, I get a phone call on, of all days, New Year's Eve. And Karen says, I'm on my way. Tell us about the call. The call is surreal. <laughs> it's the most surreal experience. I, I feel like it's on par. It's definitely on par with having a baby, you know, for sure. And there are just no words, you know, when you get this call and you're told, okay, um, it's time. We have a heart for you. Like it's, and I, I literally had to stop in my tracks and just say, wait a second, I, I really need a few minutes. <laughs> what did you just say? Because I was at, I was, um, so I was basically at home, but because it was New Year's Eve, I was, uh, we were quarantining with my sister and her kids up in Kenny Bunkport, um, Maine. So, which is actually closer to Tufts than home is to Tufts. So I had packed my bag just in case, because I bring this bag with me everywhere. <laughs> it's my, um, in case I get the call bag. And um, yeah, so I, 
you know, it was like 11 o'clock in the morning and we were just about to bring our dogs to the beach and um, enjoy the day outside a little bit. And um, I get the call and I say, okay, where's the bag? I say to Dustin, we got to go, you know, we got to, we got to get there. And um, it, it was absolutely surreal. So of course, um, you know, somebody has been, who's been with me through this entire journey, like, yeah, like we said, through 2006, even before that really, um, has been Lisa. And so of course, as I'm walking into Tufts, she was my call. You know, she was the one I really needed to talk to, um, person to person, because, um, as you, as we all know, her words of wisdom <laughs> really stick with us. And I, and I have to say, as I was going into that, um, operating room, it was her words that were in my mind, like, we've got this and failure is just not an option. And, um, you know, as I was going in, I, I remember the nurses saying, you know, your husband looks really nervous, but I really can't tell with you. You look like you're okay. And um, I just had to say, you know, I, I just, I have so much support from my husband and, and some really, really great friends that have, that have really inspired me throughout this. And, and um, it's their words that I'm hearing in my head right now. And so all I can do is just go into this and, and do it, you know, it's, it's time. So 2020, as we all know, was pretty much a dumpster fire for the, for the entire world. <laughs> so you decide to really burn down the house in 2020 and you're like, just, we're just doing this. So you went into surgery, really New Year's Eve Eve, New and Eve. the first stitches in your new heart were being sewn in in 2020, but it wasn't finished until 2021. So you literally started the new year a new you. How does that feel? Incredible. I honestly don't even know if I could put words to it. I'm still in shock because of it. I, to be honest, I, it only has been a month and a half and I, I just, I, I don't know that I've wrapped my brain around it quite yet, but it's, it's so invigorating and exciting. Um, I could think so much more clearly now. So there's just so many words that come to me, but then because of the how grateful I am for this gift. There's almost all the words escape me at the same time. I don't know if that makes any sense, but um, there's a lot of emotion and it's just really exciting to start out this new year with such an incredible gift and, and already starting to feel so much more like myself. So I get your call. You're going, in, we're literally talking as you're walking into the hospital. I get off with you and I'm texting Marty. I'm like, Karen got the call. So we're, we're New Year's Eve, Marty and I are texting back and forth like, okay, it's looking good. And I know he got to see you after your surgery as well. So Marty, what was, what's it like for you when one of your patients gets the call? Well, you know, it, it's not quite as impactful perhaps as, as it is for the patients, of course, but nevertheless, I, I think, you know, for us, it's still incredibly thrilling and exciting that, you know, that we've got to a point where we're going to be able to give those patients the chance. And that's really what this is. It's the opportunity to embark on a new life, really, you know, and, and, and that's what this is. It's, it's a new life. It's a new lease on life. And um, that call represents the start of that, really. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just so, you know, I'm at that point, I'm also just so thankful that, you know, I also, you know, have the opportunity and privilege to, to work with um, my colleagues in the, in the heart failure transplant world, like Amanda Vest and Dr. Nanafrio, who's head of our transplant center and our surgeons, you know, the surgeons too, who, um, you know, work endlessly um, to, 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 in this process, to harvest the new heart and to, to make sure that it gets put in correctly, of course, and that take care of the patients after. And I'm just, I'm honored to, to not only to have the opportunity for the patients, but also for all the other healthcare givers who, um, are there for the patient to give them that new lease on life. It's really, uh, it, it takes a, it takes a village. It's a community to, to get this done at this level. And I'm honored you know, to work with people that can do that. And of course, honored to have that opportunity to give it to patients um, who so desperately need it, like Karen did. So I'm calling out to the community who's watching. If they have any questions, they can post them now and I will address them in a moment. So if you do have a question, please post it now. Reminder, we are live on February 12th, 2021. If you're watching this after that, we're not gonna address your individual questions, but we might respond to them later. Um, so th this has been 
like literally a life's journey. This is this has been a long time to get to where we are. Um, I, I really have, you know, we're looking for different stories to feature on Tales from the Heart so that we can bring that clinical perspective, that research perspective, the HCMA's role in this and these amazing patient stories together. Um, and I'm like, I couldn't think of a better story to follow for a long period of time than Karen's. Um, it's inspiring. She was able to do so many things right. And I don't want to take away from the value of her own advocacy, her own engagement in her health care when she was quite young. And most people her age wouldn't be thinking, well, I better move to an area where the health care system is what I'm going to personally need. I, I want to have a child, but I need to do so safely. And I need to make sure my cardiac team is involved in this. And I need to make these decisions for my long-term well-being. This is my one wild and precious life. What do I want to do with it? And I think Karen has, has utilized all the resources made available to her. She's made some tough decisions. She's been incredibly brave and strong and just an amazing role model for Eloise, her daughter. And we made it to today. I'm going to cry um, because for 25 years this year, the HCMA has tried to save and improve the lives of those with HCM. And everything we did that was theory worked. Every relationship we've established was meaningful. Every researcher and scientist we've partnered with has brought amazing advances to our field. And Karen's able to be here today talking to me, who's got a donor heart, who's talking to another donor heart. And I do want to take a moment and remind everybody that February 14th is more than Valentine's Day. It's National Donor Day. It happens to be the day I went home from the hospital with my new heart, but it's always National Donor Day. So I encourage everybody to sign their organ donor card or their driver's license as their state requires. Let your family members know what your wishes are about being a donor. Uh, my sister was a donor. I'm a recipient. Karen is a recipient. We want everybody to have a chance if they need it to get a second chance on life. So Marty, this is a big story. What's your take home message from it all? Well, uh, the take home, I think the take home message, you know, would be on the lines of what you were really just saying is that, you know, Karen story, her journey, you know, represents, you know, the, the, the work and the, 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 the passion of so many different people that have come before to um, really provide the opportunity for HCM patients to have the kind of treatments that will allow them to have the great quality of life that they deserve. And we hope for almost all normal longevity and um, so that they can then carry on the way they deserve to carry on in life and to engage life the way that they should with their husbands, their babies, and, uh, and, and their family. And, and, and Karen's story represents that so well. And, and I couldn't be more happy for her that she's doing as well as she is at this point. And I have, if I can, I have a question for, for Karen. Karen, I've known you for a long time and you've been, you know, you've been an inspiration, you know, to me on a number of different levels. One of them is that despite, you know, having to face two of the most important consequences of this disease, sudden death and end stage heart failure requiring transplant, your, 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 your perspective, your view, your outlook has always been so positive the energy that you exude always um, in the right place. How have you done that? Maybe you could share a little bit about how, how you have handled this so well for so long. And, and, and maybe some of those insights would be helpful for, for others going through similar battles right now. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marin and Lisa. I mean, 
it's such a privilege to be sitting here um, because of your care, because of all of those who have come before me, which I think you so eloquently said, because of Dr. Vest, because of everyone who's put in so much um, to help me and help this community and help all of us. Um, I just, I feel like at the root of a lot of this for me is, is being grateful and um, just trying to connect with, not always easy, you know, but trying to connect with like what has really happened here in order for me to be here right now. And to, I just, I feel so fortunate and so privileged in many ways that um, all this work has been done. Um, I just feel like I was so lucky to have found the right people, but it, I feel like it's these people in my life. It's been you, it's been Barry Marin, it's been Lisa, it's been my family. It's been a lot of wonderful friends that have just supported me when I've needed, you know, an, an extra ear or when I've, um, you know, just kind of felt like, gosh, what is going on here? I don't know what's happening with my health, my husband, you know, our daughter, there's just so many people in our lives. And I feel like just looking at continuing to look ahead and just saying, you know, I'm just so grateful for what I have and for this life. I mean, there's nothing more precious than every single day waking up and just looking outside and just knowing, okay, I'm alive. And I, I know that sounds really hokey and kind of cheesy, but it's really, for me, it's always been the small things, you know, it's been the connection. I, I like to be a social person and um, I feel like just, um, you know, staying grounded with other people and, um, and also just, yeah, trying to advocate when, when I know something doesn't feel right to just speak up about it, which hasn't come naturally for me as Lisa could tell you. Um, but speaking up, um, staying on course, trusting what's inside um, to kind of lead the way um, and just in reaching out, you know, I, I feel like one of the hardest times was when um, it was that three years of going back and forth, not really knowing what was going on. Because even when I had some of these sudden death events and um, the end stage heart failure, having being on being in your care and being in the care of this wonderful team, I felt supported. And even though I knew I couldn't control really what was going on with my health, just having that support of, of you and of the entire team of Lisa, of all these people around me, it just, it supported me. There was, there was nothing else that I needed, you know, that, that, that was more than enough. And that's what really kept me going. And that is what keeps me going. Um, and I really hope to be able to help a lot of other people on their journey to, to find that and to, to see that because really that's what we are as a community in this. And, um, it takes a huge village. This, my story is so little about me as opposed to it is about everyone that plays a role in this story, which is many, many people. Um, yeah. So when I'm thinking about, um, you know, my family is like, oh, we want to put something up on you on social media, like a, a picture of you in the hospital or something. And I said, no, you know what? No, actually, I just want a picture of every single person that has helped me through this. And that would probably cover the entire screen of like a lot of people, because that's what this is all about for me. Um, so I, that's, that was really well said. Um, and I have no doubt that you are going to have an enormous impact on many, many more people to come here because of the person that you are and the journey that you've been on. Appreciate, you know, you, I really appreciate you sharing that with us. Thanks. Thank that was, so that was honest. That, yeah. and for anybody who doesn't know Karen, you know, that wasn't a script that that's who she is. And that's the young lady that I met back in 2006 and the, the young mom and the, and the transplant warrior all wrapped into one. I've always been taken by every call that I've ever had with Karen. There's always gratitude for what she's learned, for what she's experienced and what she's living. And in a world that can be very negative and dealing with illness is not exactly what I would call a sunshine and roses positive thing. You have to look for the good. You have to find your joy. It will not find you. You must find it. And I will tell you that we've got a couple of comments here and then I'll give you my closing thoughts. Um, we, we have shed a light today for a number of viewers, listeners who did not think that non-obstructed HCM could turn into something else. They thought that that was where it would stay. So we've educated a number of people that non-obstructed HCM isn't better than obstructed. It's not worse than obstructed. They are different 
physiologies that could go down different paths. And that is why it is critical to ensure that your long-term care model includes a high volume center. Community cardiologists and local cardiologists are important, but we need that high level team because they see the nuanced differences. They can see trouble coming. Marty told me in 2011, we might need to start talking about transplant, at which point I told him to shut up, but we weren't gonna talk about that then. It's too soon. I don't feel that bad. I'll let you know when it's okay to talk about it. Poor guy, poor guy. Just think about that for a moment. The look on his face was like, I'm afraid of this conversation. So <laughs> we had the conversation again in 2016 and I said, okay, you can say the word now. I almost waited too long. I should have listened better in 2011. I should have planned it as well as Karen planned it. And she planned it well. We knew what was coming. It wasn't a surprise. And look at this young lady, six weeks after a heart transplant. She looks great. She's sounding great. Her optimism is infectious. Um, and I think that's what we're getting across on all of the comments here. We don't have a lot of questions today. We just have a lot of wonderful comments of support and how interesting the story is. Um, so there is one question. What is the prevalence or role of mechanical support as a bridge to transplant? So we're talking LVADs, left ventricular assist devices. Are they used in HCM? They have a very small role. Marty, would you explain them? Yeah, yeah. Mechanical support, or, or as you said, left ventricular assist device or LVADs are mechanical devices. They're external pumps is what they are. And they can be effective at doing two things, either what we call bridging a patient with end stage heart failure if they get too sick before they get a heart transplant to getting them better so that they can get a heart transplant. And sometimes for those that are not candidates for transplant, um, they can be put in uh, permanently for destination treatment to make patients at least feel better um, in that setting. They, they have a small role in HCM um, in patients as a bridge to transplant. They are, some HCM based are not candidates for, for LVADs because of the anatomy of the heart. Sometimes if the heart still is too thick and small, if you try to put a left ventricular assist device in a heart like that, it won't work. So, so the candidacy comes down to looking at the anatomy of that individual HCM patient's heart to really determine if it's gonna work or not. I wasn't a candidate for an LVAD. Karen wasn't a candidate wasn't for an LVAD. Candidate. You're gonna hear a story next week. I'm going to be meeting with um, Hannah and Amy. Um, their hearts are in the bag with my heart. So we're gonna do look at the anatomy, meet them now and see their hearts there. So uh, Hannah was this close to getting an LVAD and you'll see the difference in her anatomy. Join us next week on Tales from the Heart. And we're going to be talking about that. It's going to be a very visual podcast. So I would encourage you to watch that one live um, or rewatch it on Facebook, but it will be a um, podcast as well. So I, I appreciate everybody's time today. We went a little bit long on this when we're a little over an hour, but it was just such a great story. We had to tell it in its detail. Um, so I'm, I'm going to leave today with the, my favorite quote, from my favorite poem, um, which is A Summer's Day by Mary Oliver. And my favorite line is, tell me what it is you plan to do with your one wild and precious life. And Karen, you've answered that question quite well today. So thank you so much for sharing. We wish you a lot of healing and peace in the next couple of weeks. The first couple of months post-transplant's a little, little bumpy, but we'll get you through it. And we'll be here through that part of the process. And we know that you'll be part of the community for many decades to come, sharing your story as an inspiration to those who will come behind you. Marty, thank you for not only participating in the podcast and not only for the wonderful care you've given Karen, myself, my family, and many others, but what we're doing here for the community to just raise awareness at a whole different level and your caring and your compassion, which might be genetic from dad, I don't know, maybe mom too, but I think what your dad has given to this community is immeasurable and what you're continuing to give to the community is immeasurable, so thank you. Thanks Lisa, and of course, thanks Karen. Thank so you. thrilled for you. You look great, as Lisa was saying. Thank you for sharing the story. It'll stand as an important record as we go forward to help others and you will continue to be a force for that and change for the good. So thank you 
and for your time and, and efforts today. Uh, appreciate you telling the story. Thank you. Thank you so much. One last shout out to the entire team at Tufts for their assistance in this particular podcast. And I know they're going to be sharing this uh, with their uh, population, hopefully through social media and other networks. But join us again for Tales from the Heart. The schedule for uh, Marty Marin and I are available here on the Facebook page. Our next podcast um, with a medical co-host is Harry Lever on March 26th. Um, topic to be determined, but next weekend or next week, next Friday uh, or Thursday, I'm getting my second vaccine next Friday, so I might not do the podcast on Friday, I might do it on Thursday. We are going to be talking to Amy and Hannah about their transplant journey as well. Um, it is heart month. We want to focus on these stories throughout the month to make sure that we're spreading the awareness that we need to about heart disease in general and HCM specifically. Thank you all so much for joining us and thank you for those who are viewing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Heart. For more information on HCM, we encourage you to visit our website at 4hcm.org. Join us online for the conversation on our Facebook page or in our private group. Facebook page can be found at Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association and our Instagram handle is at for HCM Warriors. That's the number four HCM Warriors. Follow us on Twitter at 4HCM.org. For those members of the LinkedIn community, you may want to follow the conversation on the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association group. Join us today. To contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, you can call 973-983-7429. You can email us at support at 4hcm.org or visit us online at our website 4hcm.org and send us an email from there. The Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is located in New Jersey and operates on East Coast time. We would like to thank our sponsors, Myocardia, Invite, Boston Scientific, and Cytokinetics for their support of this program. Please remember to sign up for the HCM Strong Tour, Big Hearted Warriors Unite. Our virtual tour will begin September 3rd and include dates September 17th, October 8th, October 10th, October 24th, October 29th, November 12th, December 3rd, and December 10th. A few other events will be added. Check the updated registration information at 4hcm.org. Hope to see you at one of our upcoming meetings. The HCMA is partnering with Myocardia, 23andMe, and others to help learn more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Learn more about these initiatives at 4HCM.org. Invite, a genetic testing company and a sponsor of Tales from the Heart, is proud to provide free genetic testing to families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Please learn more at 4HCM.org. Hey, we know life with HCM can be challenging and support is critical. That's why the HCMA has created an online support group system to help you and your loved ones live better with HCM. Join us. The HCMA is seeking volunteers on a number of different projects, including our online support group system, our peer-to-peer, big-hearted friend system, and our legislative subcommittee. Please visit 4HCM.org to learn more today.